here on this bright sunny morning. Did you hear that? Okay. Wow. Now you can hear it. Gee whiz, they can hear that across the street. Um, we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, uh, as we enter, this is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Uh, you'll notice the way I said that. Sundays in Lent are like islands. Uh, they don't count in the 40 days of Lent. They're little islands of remembering the resurrection in the middle of uh, remembering the passion. So this is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. So I'm glad that you're here. I have an announcement, and that is that there was a schedule change because of the inclement weather this weekend. The, the uh, Women's Connect is, ha, was moved to this coming Saturday at 9 o'clock, according to the sign I saw this morning. So, uh, ladies, if you uh, weren't able to come you know, yesterday, but you are able to come next week, you've got a reprieve, so you can join um, the Women's Connect this Saturday at 9 in the morning. Other announcements are printed in the bulletin. Just to remind you that you will see a, a box at the welcome desk, that uh, box, uh, we use it for all different kinds of things, but we're using it in Lent to receive your prayer requests. So if you have a prayer request that you would like the staff to pray for, uh, once a week the staff will gather and take those requests and we will pray for the requests that are, are left there in the box uh, during this season of, of Lent. Also, the, the lounge out here um, is uh, now a prayer closet. So if during the season of Lent you like to do some devotional activities or just be reflective in a different kind of a space, that space is available for you to do that. And this Wednesday, we will begin uh, the pastor's Lenten study. You can join us at 1 or at 6 in the evening one in the afternoon or six in the evening uh, for a Lenten study that will be based on events in the Gospel of Mark related to Jesus' journey to um, his passion. There is a new membership class that's going to start um, next Sunday at uh, 10 during the Sunday School Hour. If you're interested, if you're not a member of the church, you'd like to join the church, speak to me afterwards, and uh, uh, we'd love for you to join that, that class. Other things are printed in the bulletin. Just pray for the youth, the senior high youth today, as they conclude their weekend retreat and travel back home. Let's prepare ourselves for worship as we listen to our prelude, Standing in the Need of Prayer.
If you're able, I invite you to stand with me as we go into our service with a call to worship from Isaiah 30, verse 15. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. Let us join our hearts and voices together as we come before God in prayer. O oh God, your glory is always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. God has brought us back to himself through the living word, Jesus Christ. And because he has done that, we can have peace with God and peace with each other. So I say to you this morning, the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share that peace with our neighbor this morning. Can you hear me now? I'd invite the, any children that are with us this morning, if you'd like to come up and sit with me and have a little conversation, I invite you to do that now. Here they come. Hi, guys. Well, thanks for joining me up here this morning. Oh, here comes another one. Good morning. 
So this isn't really this like happy of a topic, but it's kind of like what we're talking about. Well, it is what we're talking about this morning in church, um, and that is a topic of um, suffering. You know what suffering is. You ever hurt yourself? You ever like I don't know, get it, you know, fell and bruised your knee or ever had a toothache or anything like that, then you know what suffering is. It's something that hurts, right? It's, it has some pain uh, with it. And, and so suffering, everybody that's alive at some point in time has some pain, different kinds of things that we experience. And sometimes the pain isn't necessarily... A, a, a pain or a, our body isn't necessarily suffering. Sometimes our, our feelings have been hurt. Do you ever, anybody ever hurt your feelings? You ever have your feelings hurt? You know, somebody says something and makes you feel bad or, you know, you, know, you, know, you, you feel like you did something wrong and you're really getting nailed for it. I mean, you're being told about it. Or maybe you didn't do anything wrong at all. Maybe you were just doing something normal and you still got something said that made your feelings hurt. It's not very pleasant, is it? But the Bible tells us that suffering and um, that sometimes for not doing anything wrong and yet we still suffer will happen. Um, and when that happens, one of the things that we can remember is we can think about Jesus. You know, and Jesus was the best person who ever lived. He never did anything wrong. He never did anything that anybody would punish him for. You know, in any kind of, you know, there wasn't anything they did that justified or was, was bad to, to be punished for. He did everything right. And yet he suffered because he did something good. Everything he did was good. And yet he still suffered. He still had pain. And we think about Jesus on the cross and how much that hurt and, and all the things that, nasty things that some people said about him. So when we suffer... If we, if we get our feelings hurt or if something bad happens when we don't really deserve it, one of the things that we can do when that happens is to think about Jesus and to think about the way that even though that happened to him, he didn't fight back. He didn't say nasty things to other people. He didn't try to make them suffer, but he just bore it and he did it and, and I don't understand how this works but because he did that it helps us it saves us so I hope that you will have a suffering free week but if you do just remember Jesus knows exactly what you're going through okay let's pray Lord thank you for this day thank you Lord that you're with us in the good times as well as in times when we suffer or have our feelings hurt or go through a difficulty I pray you'd help these young boys to remember that this week. Watch over and protect them and their families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, we're thankful today that... Everything we experience in our lives, you know about. There's nothing that we experience, nothing that we go through, that you are not aware of it. We sometimes, Lord, feel like you don't know. We sometimes feel, Lord, like maybe that it's not that big a deal to you. And yet, we know that's not true. We know, Lord, from what you've said in the scriptures that your eye is always on us, that we're never out of mind, your mind. So Lord, help us to, to believe that is true and help us, Lord, to respond to the things that come into our life with the knowledge that you care, with the knowledge that you understand, with the knowledge that you love us in spite of whatever it may be. And Lord, help us in our living to to respond to other people with that same kind of love and care and thoughtfulness. 
And Lord, even for those who would mistreat us or even those um, who oppose us for whatever reason, even those who misunderstand us, sometimes it seems willfully, help us, Lord, to take the mind of Christ to, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give the, uh, the cloak as well as the tunic. Lord, help us to do the kinds of things that you told us to do when, when people take advantage of us uh, in order that we can be a witness, in order that we can be a demonstration of your love working in the world through your people. Help us to be those people. Lord, we pray for our world where there's so much tension, where there's so much misunderstanding, where there's so much violence and hatred, and where there's such a need for a counterpoint to all of that. There's such a need for a witness that is faithful to the gospel, faithful to the life of Jesus. Lord, whether it's right here in our town of Chambersburg or whether it's across the face of the globe, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us as your followers and other Christ followers all over the earth to be the counterpoint to the violence, to the hatred, to the mistreatment that goes on. Lord, give us uh, uh, opportunities to shine the light of Christ into the darkness by the way that we live and the way that we speak, by the deeds that we do. We pray for places with great brokenness, places like the Middle East, Israel, and Palestine, and we pray, Father, for peace. We pray, Father, for the situation that uh, fluctuates with violence in the Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia. We pray, Father, for places, communities in our own country where there's tension in cities. And we pray, Lord, that you will bring peace and that you'll bring witness and that, Lord, your truth will shine forth and draw people to Christ. Lord, help us to do our part to make that happen where we live. And we'll give you the, the praise and the glory and the thanks through our Lord Jesus Christ who gave his all for us and who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we have a blessing of having special music uh, shared with us by uh, Elizabeth Hill.
and through eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on And through eternity I'll sing on Thank you, Elizabeth. Reading from Deuteronomy 16:7, Everybody shall give as they are able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So we give our gifts to God, whether it's in singing or, or doing or serving or in our, our tithes and our offerings. Uh, so as we present our gifts to the Lord this morning, let them be a representation not just of our financial contributions, but the contribution of our life to the work of Christ. Let's come before the Lord with our tithes and our offerings this morning.
Please receive, Lord, these are tithes and our offerings and use them for the purposes of your kingdom, that Jesus Christ might be honored here and across the earth. In his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as Ben Shellhays comes forward to read our morning scripture. The scripture this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil." Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, Eight in all were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. The word of the Lord. 
Please be seated. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? We thank you, O Lord, for your word. It's always relevant. It always speaks to us when we open our heart and our mind to the working of your Holy Spirit in Scripture. So speak to us today, your message, and help us, Lord, to have the resolve and the commitment, the desire, the strength of your Spirit to put it into practice in our living. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, um, as I said to the the boys this morning in the children's message, suffering is not a pleasant topic. I mean, it's uh, a reality, it's something that we all face, um, and especially when it comes to suffering that has to do, uh, come from the hands of other people, or the words of other people, or the actions of other people, or the unjust um, things that might be brought into our life because of the decisions of other people. And that seems to be the context, well, it is the context in which Peter continues to write uh, in this uh, letter, uh, this first letter that he's written. If you remember back the last couple of weeks, um, the topics that he covered in the earlier sections of the letter had to do with the act of submission uh, to different kinds of authority as an act of respect and um, commitment to Christ. And those areas had to do with uh, government, unjust government, and the ways that the people to whom Peter was writing already were uh, suffering because of their faith in Christ. It had to do with the relationship between masters and servants and and the way that the servants were treated and, and uh and the suffering that they sometimes endured by unjust uh, masters or employers. And then the, thirdly, uh, the third one had to do with the relationships between husbands and wives in a culture where wives were second-class citizens and, and yet had an opportunity to be witnesses to their husbands. And also husbands were challenged by Peter to be considerate of their wives and to look at them as co-heirs with them of the blessings of God. And so they're on equal footing. And now in that background, having talked about these, these relationships where the potential existed for uh, believers to suffer at the hand of those who had authority over them, he goes on to speak in a broader term about how we might suffer for doing something that is good. So... So he, he begins by saying to them, you know, it kind of concludes this thought by saying, finally, so it's kind of wrapping things up here in this thought, all of you be like-minded. Uh, and I thought about that for a second, like-minded. When, when we say we're like-minded, that doesn't necessarily mean that we all hold the same opinions, Okay. In the church, we are to be like-minded. Uh, that doesn't mean we all think exactly alike. We're not in lockstep with each other like we're some kind of robotic horde going forward. He's talking in the context, remember the context. He's talking in the context of the way that we respond to others, even those in authority, and that ultimately our response has to do with our witness for Christ. So be like-minded, Peter says, how? In honoring Christ, in the way that we treat each other, the way that we respond to people in authority, but in, generally, in general, putting people first, treating people with respect. And you think about churches that get broken up because of disunity. Unity is fostered in the life of a congregation such as ours. When like-mindedness is practiced, not all of us thinking exactly the same thing, but all of us sharing the same thought and commitment to Jesus Christ and how we're to live our lives to honor him in the midst of each other, with each other. So he says, so be like-minded. Let this unity kind of thing, this unity by honoring Christ in your life towards each other, you know, 
make that a priority. Then he says, he goes on, he kind of expands on that. He says, be sympathetic. You know, be sympathetic. So um, when I sympathize with somebody, I imagine myself, there's a, empathy and sympathy are kind of similar. Um, sympathy seems to be a little bit different in the sense of it's outside of the experience. Empathy seems to be one that you share it together. But either way, when he says be sympathetic to one another, it means to appreciate the suffering of other people. To appreciate or to, to not discount other people's uh, experiences of difficulty or pain. So that when, and I know this happens among us here, you know, when we have a friend who's in the hospital or we have a friend that's going through some suffering, you know, we have sympathy for them. We want to help. We want to do something that might lighten the burden. You know, I've seen that in the life of this congregation many different times. And he said, love one another. You know, and so often we think of, when we hear the word love, we just had Valentine's Day on Wednesday, and there's a lot of schmaltz that goes on in Valentine's Day. Let's just say it is real schmaltzy, it's real saccharine, my teeth ache when I think about it. Uh, but love is not that. Love isn't, you know, there's an emotion of love, obviously, but love is so much more, especially Christian love. Love is an action. It's a verb. It's something that we do. It's something that is expressed. It's something that can be seen in deeds, not just heard in words. And that's the way you're supposed to respond to each other. We're to love. If we sympathize with somebody, one of the ways that we love them is to be there for them, to help, to, to support, to help share the load. And then he, he kind of rounds out the list here of what we should do um, in, in terms of like-mindedness and demonstrating our care for one another by saying, be compassionate and humble. Compassionate and humble. Compassion is this interesting Greek word. It's kind of visceral, literally. It has to do with a feeling that is inside, like in your, I said it on Ash Wednesday for some reason, your gut. You know, you're just moved with compassion for someone. You hear a story and your heart goes out to them. And so we're to be compassionate and humble with each other. We, we're to, to really enter in to one another's uh, concerns, not only through prayer, but by demonstrations of love. And we don't do it in a condescending kind of way. It's not sort of like, you know, oh, you know, pity them. It's not pity, it's humility. It's humbly coming alongside of them uh, in that moment. Um, knowing that it could be that we are in the same boat. It could be us. And so we are compassionate towards people. So, so Peter kind of moves on in this whole uh, thought in terms of, you know, there's opportunities for us to be witnesses, even to those who might cause us suffering. But certainly in our, our suffering, we can be of any sort, we can be a witness for Christ because there's going to be times in every relationship that we have, even good relationships, where someone does something that, that hurts or offends. I said that in the, the, to the boys. You know, sometimes our feelings get hurt by either intentional words or thoughtless words. Um, but what Peter is saying to these Christians is, um, don't repay evil with evil. Uh, repay evil with blessing. Uh, because to this you were called, so that you'll inherit a blessing. So our response when, when we're hurt, when we're offended, this is the turn the other cheek application. This is the, if someone asks you for your cloak, give them your tunic. This is if somebody asks you to go a, walk a mile with them, you'll go another mile. That's, Peter's just reiterating what he heard Jesus teach. And he's bringing it into the context of, of this kind of situation where, you know, somebody's oppressive. Of course, Jesus was speaking about uh, you know, to people who are oppressed by Roman authorities, 
uh, who might tell somebody to carry something for them for a mile. He says, go an extra mile. Here's a, a, a day-to-day living through authority kind of situation too. If someone insults you, don't retaliate by being, doing something evil, but give them a blessing. Go a little bit further. When was the last time you had an opportunity to do that? When was the last time that somebody did something or said something that, you know, your first response was not to bless them. Oh, I'd like to bless them all right. But a real blessing. A thought of, you know, I had to pray for this person. I need to show them God's love. I can do something a little bit more. And maybe it wasn't anything they did intentionally, but they just kind of did something thoughtless. And that's probably more often the case than intentional, but thoughtlessness can hurt too. But that we turn around to do something positive, helpful. We're to be above retaliation of evil with, to evil. But we're, we're called to do whatever it, what we can to be at peace because in doing that, we get a blessing as well. We have to remember in every circumstance that it, our life as a follower of Jesus is above all other things a life that where we're seeking to honor him. We're living to lift up Jesus. We're living in such a way so that people don't see us, but they see Christ. That we're demonstrating Christ's goodness in the way that we respond to Jesus, or to others as Jesus would respond to them. You know, we're to be considerate, just as Believing husbands were to be considerate of their wives, were to be considerate of the needs of those who might offend us. But we know that in doing, in living that way, we have this assurance that God hears the prayers of righteous people. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter is saying to his listeners, you know, be different. Don't do what everybody else would do. Don't repay evil with evil, but with good. And then he goes on in verses 13 and 14 to lift up this principle uh, that we should hold in mind that when we do good but aren't appreciated for it, you know, still we, we need to realize that there's a blessing in, in doing what was good in the first place. Um, if you ever listen to the music from the musical Wicked, um, there's this line in there, no good deed goes unpunished. And it, it, at first I thought, well, that's really negative. That's really down. No good deed goes unpunished. But in a real, it's kind of not no good deed, but many good deeds go, uh, get punished. You know, people do good things for good reasons and they are misunderstood. Not that God punishes us for doing good, but sometimes others might respond um, with a judgment, misunderstanding, misjudging us in what we do, or in our intentions. Um, in those situations when someone, mis maybe it seems intentionally misunderstanding us, we need to look beyond the offender. We need to look beyond... Uh, whatever, wherever that is coming from, after we've done our best to be lovingly understood, we need to place that situation into the hands of God, who is our ultimate righteous judge and knows our heart and knows our true intention. So in the long run, uh, as Peter says, um, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. We need to not fear those who cause us suffering. And in Peter's case, as he's talking to these believers who are already suffering, you need to be looking to Christ to realize that we're covered and understood by Jesus. And so he goes on to extrapolate on that and says, but in your hearts reverence Christ as Lord. As we said last week, our goal in all of this is to bring people to Jesus by the way that we speak, the way that we live, the love that we show, our kindness and our responses. We're to revere Christ in our hearts as Lord. What's it mean to revere someone, to honor, to respect? You know, that, that Christ is preeminent 
in our choices, in our words, in our acts, we lift him up. Um, in every thought we hold, every word we speak, every deed we do, even if it means problems for us, even if it means suffering of some sort for us, we want to revere Christ. We want to honor Christ. Some decisions that we have to make, if we're going to honor Christ, are going to work against us. doesn't matter. Because in honoring Christ, we know that we're going to be blessed. That's the way God works. So, we don't get into arguments about the Christian faith with unbelievers. We don't become contentious with people. We don't put people down or mock people or ridicule people in conversations about our Christian faith. We're to be prepared to give scriptural, theologically sound, reasonable, and historically accurate reasons for why we believe what we believe. That's what Peter says we're to do. Always be prepared to give it a reason, an answer for the faith that you have. A lot of people miss that point, I'm afraid. And that's why there's a lot of stress and struggle and division and animosity and all kinds of negativity in the church because we can't have conversations that are peppered with love and care and understanding. Remember, the goal is, again, a clear conscience by not saying or acting in a way that would legitimize somebody's judgment against our faith or against Christ, but that rather we would be a witness for Jesus and offer something appealing to people that is grounded and rooted in truth, that they might come to trust him for themselves. And so that means that the burden in these situations falls squarely on our shoulders, just as they would for Christ. Peter goes on and says, For it's better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ suffered also once for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, is put to death, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Peter says it's a better thing for, for his readers and for you and me to suffer because of our witness, because of doing good, in, in, in this climate in which we live, in this world in which we live, which is so negative anymore, than it, it would be for us to, to slip into some kind of argumentative attitude or put, downing some, put down somebody who is in opposition to us and to Christ. It is far better for us to just maintain the spirit of Jesus and maybe suffer for it than, than to try to get an upper hand. We're in good company with the Lord in this because he suffered the only sinless person who ever walked on this earth he suffered to bring us to God so that we could know God and God vindicated his life and his sacrifice by raising him from the dead for us so we likewise ought to be able to suffer injustice from time to time, if necessary, in the hopes that whoever meets injustice to us or misunderstanding might see in us the life of Christ, the redemptive forgiveness of Jesus, and turn from their way and be brought themselves to God. And then there's this final word that's really kind of difficult to understand, 19 to 22, where... Peter talks about Jesus having been raised, made alive, goes and proclaims to the imprisoned spirits, to those who had been disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water, and the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And, you know, I'm, so I had to look this up. This was like, huh, what that mean? And, and Peter concludes the thought here with this picture of Jesus presenting the gospel um, uh, in, uh, to uh, spirits. Now, there's three interpretations about this passage. I'm just going to give you the three interpretations. 
You decide for yourself. The first interpretation is that Christ's spirit was in Noah, as Noah was preaching to the people of his day that they might escape the judgment of the coming flood and repent. So that's one understanding that Christ, the spirit of Christ was working through Noah in that situation thousands of years earlier. Or, or that Jesus went to the spirits of those faithful in the Old Testament in the time between his crucifixion and his resurrection. And he went to those who had been faithful in the Old Testament and preached to them that what they had long awaited for, God's plan of salvation, had been fulfilled and that he had won the victory at the cross and soon would rise from the dead. Or, another interpretation is that Jesus went to those spirits, um, he went to hell and preached to the, the condemned fallen angels um, that to tell, let them know that they had not succeeded and that God had won the victory over sin and death and that Christ was triumphing. Um, he preached that to the fallen angels. So it's interesting, it's kind of a... But the point that Peter's making in that illustration is to say that Jesus suffered and ultimately was vindicated um, and, and proclaimed that as he went to those, um, those spirits. The final picture then, Peter concludes, is this picture of Jesus who's gone into heaven. He's ascended. Peter witnessed it. And he sat down at the right hand of God in a position of authority. And he says, with angels and authorities and powers submitted to him. So this whole process of him talking about submitting to government authorities, submitting to uh, our masters, submitting to uh, husbands and marital relationship, and we understand that's mutual. In all of this, the ultimate picture of that and the, and the end result is that Christ reigns supreme with all angels and authorities and powers submitting to him because he alone is worthy, deserves that kind of submission. We're able to suffer for Christ in doing good and submitting to things as he would if we remember that everything that opposed his life in us will one day submit to Christ's righteous authority as Lord of all. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where we're living. That's why we're living the way, the way we are living, that each day we live might bring honor to him. Lord, help us today to realize that there's nothing we face in our life that you haven't faced before us. And that you, because you faced it victoriously, we can too. If we'll trust in you and submit to you and let your spirit work through us. Make that so in us today, we pray. Amen.
God the Father, and all authority is submitted to him, and he invites us to, in, the, in our life, at the conclusion of our life here on this earth, a place prepared, a feast laid out for us who live for him and overcome. May you go through this week knowing that Jesus um, is reigning supreme in this world, and as you live your life to honor him, uh, he's with you and watches over you and gives you ultimately a victory. And the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.